right. So um, in this section, uh, we're going to employ the use of three different case studies um, just to as a way for me to teach out uh, these concepts in real life situations. So our case study number one um, is the descending cloud deck. Uh, and this is the situation I alluded to with the, the fog hack earlier. Um, I'm also calling this uh, case study, How to Find Fog in Death Valley National Park. Um, so this takes place, uh, actually it was just a few weeks ago, um, and it was a Joshua tree forest called Lee Flat inside the National Park. And I used Sarah Marino and Ron Coscarosa's ebook on Death Valley uh, to help guide me around the park when I was there. And that is how I came to know of this particular location. Um, it's uh, a really, really super great uh, guide to the National Park. And I highly recommend it if you are planning to go there. Uh, so that's how I learned about it. Um, and in reading a little bit further um, about Lee Flat, um, I saw that this was uh, probably one of the most likely places that I was going to be able to find fog in Death Valley, which seemed highly unlikely. But uh, this Lee Flat is uh, a high elevation location. So it's actually 5,600 feet above sea level. So that's a mile high. Um, excuse me. And so that made it quite likely, given the right weather conditions, that um, I would be able to shoot it in fog. Uh, you know, it is a uniquely interesting ecosystem. For me, certainly, I'd never been to a Joshua tree forest, um, but I did feel that it needed something, um, some interesting conditions in order to make it visually compelling. Um, that could be sunrise or sunset, it could be fog, it could be rain, it could be snow but I just felt uh, certain that it needed some interesting uh, conditions in order for the images to be visually compelling. It is very remote. Um, it was a couple of hours from where we were based in the National Park. And for a variety of reasons, um, we were not able, I was traveling with my partner and we were not gonna be able to camp. So we couldn't really be there um, at sunrise or sunset. So that kind of ruled out that scenario. And so I set my sights on fog and I went into fog seeking mode, um, which is a default mode for me, by the way. So we were fortunate in our timing here. Um, if you recall there last month, there was some really uh, powerful weather systems moving in off the Pacific. Uh, creating all kinds of devastation and chaos up and down the coast with all the flooding. Um, but in Death Valley, uh, you know, these weather systems were, were moving across. It wasn't, there was, certainly was no flooding or anything, but, but they were definitely, you know, moving across this area. And so knowing that and knowing the elevation of Lee Flat, I knew uh, there was a chance I could find fog. I'm curious if any of you have been to this location. If you have, let me let me know in the chat. I'd love to know if you've been to Lee Flat. So let's look at how I approached this. Um, so I'm going to show you how I predicted the fog uh, using an aviation weather website. I'm sorry, I put app here, but it's not an app. It's a website. Uh, and I used uh, a couple of techniques called triangulation and inference um, to estimate the timing of the arrival of the fog. Um, I do want to uh, just kind of di diverge for a moment, um, digress, to mention uh, safety choices. Um, my partner and I both have GPS apps on our phones. I use an app called Avenza. There are others such as Gaia, uh, but these apps allow you, they will show your position on a map even when you have no cell phone service. And so we both had Avenza. We both had National Geographic Trails illustrated maps loaded into Avenza. And we both carry two-way radios for communication. Uh, so these are these are very remote locations. Um, 
you know, things can go wrong, things can get scary. And so, you know, the safety choices that we made actually probably saved our butts because, um, you know, we got up there and there were, there was no fog and we got out of the car and I went one side of the road and he went the other side of the road. And then before we knew it, just kind of out of nowhere, this fog descended on us. And, you know, we lost track of where the road was, you know, you couldn't see more than 10 or 15 feet in front of you. And so we became quite disoriented. And had we not had our apps on our phones, things could have gotten really complicated, really scary, really quickly. So please, if you're going to places like this, make sure that you uh, make um, appropriate safety choices for yourselves. All right, so a map, I love maps. Um, so I'm gonna demonstrate how I predicted this fog. And remember, this is a fog that is a cloud deck that's descending, okay? So that's the nature of the fog and we're up high. So I needed to understand when that cloud deck might drop below the elevation of Lee Flat. So to orient, orient you, the yellow uh, is Lee Flat. We have uh, Vegas two hours to the east. Um, and I've got Mammoth Lakes, California here circled uh, to the Northwest. The white arrows represent the powerful weather systems moving in off the Pacific, right? And they're moving towards the east. And that was the reason um, I've identified these two locations. So the weather website is an aviation weather website. And I'm using an aviation website because it provides data that I need to understand the elevation of the bottom of the cloud deck. But the limitation of the aviation weather website is that it only provides a forecast for major airport locations. And obviously there's no major airport in Lee Flat. So I had to, I had to work around that limitation. And so I knew the weather was moving from west to east. And so I chose uh, two locations approximately east and west of my location. Um, so that's the logic behind why I chose those locations. There's nothing magic about the particular locations, only that they um, are approximately equidistant in the two directions and that they represent the direction of the movement of the weather. So in this scenario, I could just as e easily have chosen my one of my locations as Fresno or Bakersfield. They're both also approximately west, okay? So I picked uh, two locations that straddle mine. Um, Okay, so the, moving to the next slide. So here's the website. Um, it's called US AirNet, sometimes referred to as the Air Sports Net. The URL is on the slide and it's ugly, I apologize. But I think uh, Jeff was going to place that in the chat for you all. Um, there are others out there. This just happens to be the one that I use. I've been using it for years. It's a little clunky and kind of old school but I found it to be so accurate, I stick with it. Uh, so this is how they present their forecast data for the airport location that you select. Um, it's a graphical or visual presentation, which I love. Uh, the cloud information, which is what we're interested in, is always in the bottom half of the chart. Okay, so this is the bottom half of the chart, and this is a an example only, okay? I did not think to snapshot uh, the forecast for Lee Flat. So this isn't actually for Lee Flat, but this is equivalent to what I saw for Lee Flat. Um, and so the important things to note here are, uh, we're looking at this section of the chart, which is the lowest cloud base, okay? And this is showing us that at 6 p.m., the cloud base is at 14,000 feet above sea level. And at 9 p.m., it's dropped to 6,000 feet. And at midnight, it's dropped to 3,700 feet. And then at 3 a.m., it's down at 400 feet above sea level. 
And so you see this very clear visual representation of this process of this cloud deck just descending, okay? And so this is what I saw when I looked up the forecast for Vegas and the forecast for Mammoth Lakes. So I've got the elevation of the clouds and I have a time period for both locations, okay? Back to our map. Again, this is your weather system moving towards the west. So when I looked at the forecast for Mammoth Lakes, I knew that the cloud base would drop to somewhere around 2,000 feet, um, actually between 9 a.m. and 12 p.m. because my website forecasts in three-hour intervals. So I could see that the cloud base would drop there between 9 and noon. And when I went to look for Vegas, I could see a similar scenario but later in the day. So in Vegas, it was dropping between 3 and 6 p.m. And so I was able just to use those two data points to infer the cloud base dropping below me at above 5,000 feet. That was going to occur, I guess, between 12 and 3 p.m. Um, and so that was, uh, the, that was the window that I was shooting for. And actually, we arrived up at Lee Flat about 12.30, and by one o'clock, we were in a thick, thick fog. So, I mean, the timing was really just right. So this works. It's easier than, than you think. Uh, you know, the data's out there. This is not a complicated technique. Um, and now you too can uh, predict a descending cloud deck and the fog associated with it for any location. Okay, and I know there's going to be questions about that, so just put them in the chat and I will do my best to answer questions you might have. So now I want to use some of the images I made on that shoot to teach out uh, some tips and tricks and considerations for you. Um, moisture management is, I mean, it was huge. I'm going to show you a really quick video in a minute, but this was like, there was like wind. It was not a still situation, you know, we're high up and so the wind is blowing and there's rain and I'm out there um, with a fully exposed front of my lens because I failed to bring along my lens hood. And that's typical me. I hate traveling with my lens hoods. I get really irritated by them because they take up so much space and they're just awkward. I only shoot with them when I'm forced to. Um, and because I was traveling by plane to out to California, I didn't bring my hoods. So I'm standing there shooting in this and I'm just like constantly wiping off the front of my lens. It's getting covered in raindrops. They're ruining my images. Um, so I would strongly advise if you know you're going to be shooting in fog, bring your lens hood. And I need to learn, take my own advice, I think. This is just to demonstrate, you know, the conditions I was shooting in up there. You know, you can hear the wind, it's blowing my camera strap and I'm like wiping and this just would have been so much easier if I'd have had a hood. It probably would still have been an issue, um, but it would have been more manageable. Uh, something else to think about when you're shooting in fog is exposure compensation. So this is um, your in-camera light meter gets fooled by fog, okay? Uh, it will normally completely underexpose your image uh, without you uh, making an adjustment. And so on the left, I've shown the image um, with no exposure compensation at all. This is what the camera thought it should be. And this is obviously uh, too dark. So in the middle image, I've added one stop of exposure, plus one. And in my opinion, I still think it's too dark. Uh, I tend to make my images very light and bright. And so I would have to increase the exposure for the middle image even. I would have to do that in post. Uh, so I actually shot the final, the actual image, I've shot at plus two stops of exposure. Okay, um, and I feel it gives me a higher quality file in the end to have a slightly overexposed image. But I say that 
with the proviso that you must make sure that you do not blow out your highlights. Um, so when you are dialing in quite a bit of exposure compensation, I would advise you to either turn on the highlight alert on your camera so you can see on playback if areas of your image are blown out, or you should consult your histogram to make sure you're not pushing it off uh, the end to the right. Okay. Uh, one thing to note, um, the amount of exposure compensation that you need will depend on uh, the size and luminosity of your subject, okay? So for a darker subject that takes up more of your frame, you're gonna need to dial in more compensation. Um, but if you're including a lot of sky or foggy areas, you would need less, uh, less compensation. So there's no correct exposure. This is just some guidance for you. Uh, you must make uh, your own aesthetic choices, uh, but just be aware and be intentional about it, okay? Aperture selection. I think this is something that many people don't really approach any differently in a foggy situation, um, but I do. Um, and so typically I'm shooting um, using the hyperfocal technique. So I want to maximize the depth of field uh, in my images. Uh, and I use that technique to help me do that. Uh, but in a foggy situation, because that physical distance is reduced and, and what the distant objects that do remain in your, in your frame, they're softened. They are hugely softened by all this moisture in the air. And so hyperfocal, um, you know, maximizing your depth of field, it just becomes unnecessary, in my opinion, in most situations. And so I choose a different approach in fog, and I will shoot at f8 or f11, uh, which would be the sharpest uh, apertures for my lens that I'm shooting with. And I focus directly on my subject. And that way I maximize the overall sharpness of the image for those, for those objects that are um, the most important in my frame. I'm focused on them and everything is maximally sharp. And then the distance to me doesn't matter. Um, it sort of makes things a little easier, right? Because when you uh, use a larger aperture, your, uh, your shutter speed is a little bit faster and it just kind of, you know, it's easier to manage potential camera shake if you're shooting handheld or if you're shooting on a tripod in a wind, a faster shutter speed helps you. So a choice you could make for yourself there. Uh, composition. So moving on from shooting to composition, um, focal length is uh, an important consideration in fog. Um, so using a longer focal length will actually amplify the effect that the fog, fog has on visibility. Um, and so to demonstrate that, I've got this mock-up, right? This is, this is uh, two images that represent two different focal lengths, uh, but just the reality is they weren't shot at two different focal lengths. I'm just kind of mocking up the scenario to show you visually uh, what happens. So Starting with this scene here, um, I shot it at 50 millimeters. And so I was standing uh, relatively close to this foreground tree. And I keep seeing that. It looks like a little, it looks like a little emoji or, you know, a surprise face. <laughs> um, so there wasn't a lot of distance between me and this foreground tree uh, at 50 millimeters. I'm standing pretty close to it. So there's not a whole lot of moisture in the air column between my camera and, and this tree. Um, so in the second shot here, which will pretend I stepped back, I don't know, 15 paces or 20 paces, and I, I zoomed in to 100 millimeters. So that if the approximate or the uh, composition was approximately the same, um, so now this foreground tree is significantly more faded out 
than it was when I'm standing closer and shooting at 50 millimeters. And the reason is quite simple. I mean, if you think about it, if you're shooting at 100 millimeters and you, you know, you're zoomed in, there's more moist air between you and this foreground tree. So there's more, there's just more water, there's more fog. And so it amplifies that sort of fading out effect. And it's just something to think about. You know, if you're located a long way away from your subject and you're, it sort of appears too faint and you want it to have more presence and more visual weight and appear darker, you may want to move towards your subject and use a wider, uh, a wider lens, okay? Framing, this image is probably my favorite from the shoot. Uh, I used a technique that I use quite often. I call it the shoot through technique. Um, and I'm simply, um, I'm simply standing uh, right up against uh, a kind of a straw colored uh, bush at the edge of a road actually. Um, and it's got this beautiful, you know, straw yellow color to it. Um, and I'm shooting at F 2.8 or 3.5 possibly with this, uh, vegetation right up against the front of my lens and so it just kind of blurs out and it creates this beautiful wash of color um, and I just I think this is quite an elegant way to accomplish a number of things so it brings some color into your scene because color can get pretty bland in fog and so this is a beautiful way to take you know something from your immediate environment and pull its color into your frame. Um, and it adds a lot of interest that way. It's also a lovely way to disguise, you know, there was some kind of scrubby, you know, scrubby groupings of trees here. Um, and so this helped me kind of like um, camouflage that a little bit. So I love this. You'll see other images um, in a few minutes where I use this technique. Uh, I also uh, used a lot of uh, grouping or what I call tucking. And so I was um, using a foreground tree to help frame a, back, a background tree and sort of like creating this relationship uh, between two trees. Um, this is a fun, a fun way to shoot. Uh, I really enjoyed it. I hadn't done a whole lot of it uh, before being in this Joshua Tree Forest. Um, it is important to understand that tiny movements uh, in your position can have a uh, large impact to your final image. And so I didn't, I wanted to avoid any merging. So I didn't want that little background tree to be touching, not physically touching, but you know, intersecting with my foreground tree. I, I wanted there to be some space between them. And so, you know, I might have to drop down two inches and go to the right four inches to get that space right. So it's pretty, you know, it's a finicky thing to do, but it can make uh, just such a big difference to your final uh, composition. Uh, I was gonna flip back and say on this image, I used that grouping tucking method again, and I made sure this little tree was not touching the trunk and not touching uh, the branch above it. So something for you to try. So these images uh, were made on the descent down from Lee Flat. So when we left and the fog was still sort of hanging around and there was a lot of topography um, to traverse right from 5,600 feet down to the valley floor. And so there were all these really cool diagonals um, that I embraced to add some interest and some dynamism into um, my wider, wider scenes. And the last thing I want uh, to speak to here is um, maybe consider um, shooting both wide and intimate. So don't focus on more than more on one and less on another, um, shoot, shoot both ways. And I chose to do that here, as you can see. And I wanted to refer back to um, a session 
at Out of Chicago Live by Kristen Ryan. And so she did a seeing wide and intimate photo challenge, I think a couple of weeks ago. She was uh, one of the earliest presenters this year. Um, and so she has a whole session regarding this, but this totally aligns with my approach. Um, as I've matured as a photographer, I've uh, moved away from uh, the single image approach. And I now tend to think about my work uh, in stories. So small collections of images, you know, comprising this story and the story tells uh, the total, um, you know, it's the whole story about a place. All right. I, that's what I'm interested in doing is creating small bodies of work that really capture um, the full essence of a place. So here, you know, you've got really wide, with really distant uh, trees and these giant mountains kind of fading out in the fog behind and then progressing closer and closer and all the way up to the individual relationship between trees. And so I feel, you know, that that tells us a complete story. Post-processing, just some real quick things to think about um, or lessons uh, from this shoot. So um, related to the question that was asked in the first Q&A, uh, color temperature or white balance, uh, I think that being intentional about it is critically important uh, for foggy scenes. Uh, because a foggy scene is all about mood. And as we all know, uh, as visual artists, color is hugely impactful on mood. And so you have to be uh, very intentional about your choices here. Um, as I already said, my personal preference is for cool tones for foggy scenes, certainly for this shoot. Um, but in some circumstances, uh, I think warm tones can work and greens too, uh, but they're tricky. Um, and most often I feel that blue tones uh, work best. You must make your own choices as individual artists, um, but I just would encourage you to be um, you know, consider, considered and intentional in your selections. I really prefer kind of these very cool blues. I'm not a big uh, aqua tone blue person. I like kind of, you know, cool, the coolest of blues. So I'm weird about that. <laughs> it's like a robin's egg blue. That's what I like. Um, working in Lightroom, because that's where I work most of the time, there's a slider called Dehaze. And I employ that slider uh, often for my foggy images. Um, but very judiciously. Um, I, I would encourage you to be light-handed with the use of the Dehay slider. Uh, it can quickly turn a beautifully soft, foggy scene into an artificial um, feeling scene. So uh, be light-handed with it. Um, and actually, I would encourage you to employ uh, the powerful masking now available in Lightroom to make only local adjustments. So don't apply it globally, just you know, paint it in on whatever it is you're trying to adjust. And so for this image, my favorite, I, I use dehaze on this subject tree here. And I was able to just select the tree and I just um, increased or dialed to the right the dehaze ever so slightly uh, just to give it a little bit more weight um, and clarity. 